Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Luke 20. We're continuing our journey through the Gospel of Luke in this series entitled Case Studies of Redemption. We're following Jesus all the way to the cross and beyond on his mission to redeem sinful man. We're taking a look at his interaction with people along the way. And our time in this study has brought us now to Luke 20. Lord willing, we will cover verses 1 through 19 of Luke 20 today. And we're going to see in today's passage one of several times that Jesus' authority was questioned. And we're going to notice what Jesus did and what he didn't do to validate his authority. I've titled the message this morning, By What Authority? This was a question that was asked to Jesus. This is a question we also must answer when it comes to Jesus. By what authority are we, um, are we looking to when it comes to Jesus Christ? And as we go through this passage, we see Jesus' response to his authority being questioned. I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to search your own heart. For what? For tendencies to doubt the Lord's authority in some way or another. All right? You, you think real hard about that as we go through this passage. Lord, where am I not in submission to you? Where am I doubting or not giving in to your authority? Let's pray, and then we will jump right in. Father, this is your word. We are your people. Your word is a revelation of you. Father, I pray that you would show us today what you want us to see. I pray that you, for the soul here today who may be searching and in need of Christ once and for all, that today would be the day that they call out to you, Lord, for your merciful salvation through faith in Christ. I pray if there is somebody here today who's heart is wondering, whose heart is maybe feeling lost in some way or another, that today you would, you would help that heart like a medicine. I pray that if there is a heart here today that is hardened and needs to be broken by the power of your word, that you would do just that today as well. Lord, your word, you promise, does not return void. And Father, today I pray for your word's work in each one of our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice when it comes to the authority of Jesus, we see, first of all, his authority being investigated. Authority investigated. Look at verse 1 of chapter 20 of the Gospel of Luke. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he, that's Jesus, taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spake unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? You see, there gathered that day at the temple a group of people who despised Jesus because Jesus did not fit into their religious ideal. They had grown, if I can say it this way, they had grown accustomed to doing church, if you will, their way instead of God's way. They felt it was up to them to produce goodness instead of relying on the righteousness that Christ had come to so freely give them. This group, which was made up of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they made up a, one larger group called the Sanhedrin which was the highest authority in the Jewish religion. Now, at first glance, their questions here are legitimate questions. The first question was, by what authority uh, or, or what authority do you have to do what you do? Now, do you remember what he did most recently? The last few verses, last four verses or so of chapter 19. What did he come into the temple and do? He cast out those who were not worshiping according to God's intention. And so 
some people rose up and they said, well, by what authority do you have to do these things? They weren't happy. Number two, they asked, who gave you that authority? Now, these can be, at base level, really honest questions. Questions that, truthfully, you and I have had to ask and receive an answer from the Lord as well. You see, if we don't understand that Jesus has all authority as the Son of God and that his authority comes from God himself, we get Christianity all wrong. You see, if Jesus is not it, then Christianity is not it. You see, you, you take Jesus and his authority away, and we've removed the, the whole premise of Christianity. These questions are not wrong questions if asked from an honest and humble heart. But the problem here was the heart of these people was already set. Was already set to destroying Jesus. And this was an attempt to publicly discredit him. You see, they knew that they had not authorized him to be a rabbi, and I'm guessing they felt threatened. I'm guessing they felt offended by his authoritative actions of cleansing the temple of sinful practices that they oversaw. What was happening here? Their hold on religious authority was not aligned with the spiritual authority that Jesus had, and something had to give. It was building and building and building, and something had to give here. You know, the same happens with church today. So often we run into a crossroads, a crossroads of where our will and our actions do not align with God's word, and we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice of, will I choose my own will at the expense of God's will, or will I submit to his will in a transformation of my will? That's the choice we have to make. Hey, maybe you've been questioning God's leading in your life. Maybe you've been wrongly investigating God's authority when it's his authority that deserves your full submission. Perhaps today, a bowing of your heart and a humbling of your spirit are exactly what is needed this morning. Hey, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to bow your heart and humble your spirit before God? Listen, friends, if we, if we refuse to do that, if we refuse to bow our spirit, bow our, ourselves and, and humble ourselves before the Lord, what are we doing in following Christ? We say we follow Christ. But if our spirit is obstinate and our spirit is refusing to submit to the Lord and humility is nowhere to be found, can we truly claim Christ's likeness? Notice Jesus' response to their questions. We see number two. Not only was his authority investigated, but number two, their absurdity was incriminated. Look what happens, starting in verse 3. And he answered and said unto them, I will, ask, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. Jesus answers their question with a question. That's a common way to teach, right? You ever had someone do that? You know, that you're wondering about something, someone wants to teach you something, and they ask you a thought-provoking question. So Jesus says, all right, I got your questions, but let me ask you a question. This is another example of when we submit to God, he gives what he knows we need. You answer my question, he says, you'll have the answer to yours. What is Jesus' question? Look at verse 4. He says, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it of men? Jesus called to remembrance the memory of a man that they obviously knew. That was John the Baptist. His message was one of repentance and turning to the Messiah who is Jesus. John the Baptist had been martyred for preaching truth, and these guys certainly knew him and his message. Jesus was pointing them to recognize that as the prophet, John the Baptist's authority was from God. And if John the Baptist's authority was from God, 
then Jesus' authority must have been from God because John the Baptist was preaching repentance toward Jesus. Surely these guys had to make a decision about John the Baptist's authority because it would have fallen on their shoulders as the supreme religious council to let the people know how they should look at it. It really was a simple question that was pretty clear cut. Whether answering yea or nay, an intellectually honest heart and mind would have drawn a conclusion and gone forward. But these guys carefully weighed their potential answer and look what they did, starting in verse 5. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then believe ye, not, believe ye him not? But, and if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. You see, Jesus gave them two options, the only reasonable options, and they weighed the consequences of choosing each option concerning where did John the Baptist's authority and his message come from. First option was from heaven, right? That would be an admission that John the Baptist's authority was from God. And if it was truly from God, then Jesus' authority was from God as well then these guys would have to admit accountability to God and the truth that Jesus was presenting. They knew that they had refused to submit to God's authority as presented by John the Baptist and by Jesus, and if they were to change their mind now, they'd have some splaining to do. The sad truth is this. The most merciful choice, look at me, church, the most merciful choice that these guys could have made would have been to repent and turn to God through Jesus Christ. Oh, man, their life would have drastically been transformed if they would but humble themselves and turn to Jesus Christ. It was right there for the taking. They refused to make it. Why was it so merciful? Well, an admission and submission to God's authority at its most basic level brings God's full blessing. But pride prevents us from submitting to God because we refuse to say no to self and its desires and its conclusions. That was the first option they could have admitted and chosen to humbly submit to God. And that choice, by the way, remains available to every single one of us today to humbly submit submit ourselves to God. But notice the other consideration to Jesus' question. Here's the other answer they could have said. From men. This would be, have been an admission that John the Baptist's authority was from man, which was not valid, and it would have caused an uproar among the followers of John the Baptist, and they didn't want to publicly say this, although they believed it, because these guys were too concerned about what men thought about them. They had the fear of man. So not only were they refusing to submit to God, but they also had the fear of man. And so what did they do in verse 7? They answered that they could not tell from whence it was. They pleaded the fifth. They publicly claimed ignorance, but personally believed absurdity. They thought they could play it safe by riding the fence. You've heard that phrase before. Riding the fence means not getting off on one side or another, but going right down the middle and not making a choice with truth. And silence here was no different from denying that the authority was indeed from God. So what's the big deal? Whether you flat out deny Jesus is the Savior from sin, or you just remain silent or ignorant of the matter, the outcome is the same. John chapter 3, verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And that choice must be made in every single area of life. Will I follow God or will I follow my own self-reliant conclusions? Notice Jesus' response in verse 8. And Jesus said unto them, 
neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Jesus withdrew his offer when they rejected his authority. You see, access to God is through Jesus alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Have you come to God through Jesus? Do you continue to worship God through Jesus' teaching? Life done God's way receives God's blessing. Plain and simple. But notice number three, we see their attitude illustrated. In verse 9, it says this, Then began he to speak to the people this parable. Now, we are not unfamiliar with Jesus' use of parables by now. Jesus has used many parables along the road uh, toward redemption in, this, in the Gospel of Luke. He took this opportunity to point out the eternal ramifications of the hard-hearted rejection of Jesus by these guys. It says this, Jesus told this story, A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. This is a picture of God giving his people freedom to choose what he has left to do, what he has left them to do. And this is not the first time he's illustrated a par- with a parable this way, where, where somebody goes off and then they come back and there's a, there's a reckoning. Um, this is not the first time. We've already seen that on more than one occasion. And so here the husbandman goes away. He entrusts his work to the people. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. This was a picture of the many prophets that God had sent to his people to lovingly warn them And it was a picture of their constant rejection of God and his love. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, oh, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, that, that was obviously a foreshadow of their coming choice to kill Jesus, the very son of God. Notice Jesus puts the ball back in their court yet again with a hypothetical question. Now, he did not give them the answer to absurdly answer this time. But here's what he said. Look down at your Bible. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Now, this was a prediction of the coming conversion of many Gentiles, even like you and me. And he beheld them and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Jesus says, I'm going to change the illustration here a little bit to that of a building. He points out that the very cornerstone that these religious builders, if you will, had rejected was the true cornerstone that God had put there himself. God was putting them in their place by replacing their own self-made authority with his true authority. Let me ask you this morning, do you perhaps see some of the same attitude of the Sanhedrin dwelling in your own heart? It's a question I must ask myself. Do I see some of the same attitude of the Sanhedrin dwelling in my own heart? Maybe there's not a blatant rejection of Jesus, but certainly certainly there's not a full reception of him and his meekness either. 
Can I beg you, church, let God change that in your heart today. Let God break you. Fall upon that chief cornerstone in repentance. Let him break you and rebuild you. Notice finally, though, unfortunately, instead of repentance, we see anger intensified. Verse 19, and the chief priests and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. (coughs) They were pretty perceptive at this point. They were ready to arrest and destroy him right then and there. They had had enough. But again, one of their vices even prevented them from doing that. What was it? It was fear of man. The sad part was that God had intended to point their hearts to him. And what he intended to do a great work in their lives was actually allowed by them to harden their hearts more toward him. Just a simple point I want to make here. Is there something hardening your heart right now? Hardening your heart toward the things of the Lord? When a humble look at whatever that thing is might actually turn you in tenderness toward him and the work he wants to do in your life? Can I beg you to do something this morning? Don't leave here any more hardened than you came in. Let God break your heart in a real and tangible way. Maybe there's something that's coming to your mind right now that needs to be submitted to him. Perhaps it's an attitude. Perhaps it's a lack of dependence on him. Maybe it's obedience to his word. Perhaps it's a submission to his will. Maybe it's time for you to stop resisting his beautifying work on your heart. Don't don't push against the Lord. Receive the Lord. Don't let an internal whatever cause you to resist what God wants to do in your life, no matter what that looks like, but receive the work of God in your heart. So let me ask you this. Do you see yourself in any of what we see in the Sanhedrin today? I'll tell you this, it's not a coincidence that you are here and we are looking at this passage today. Maybe God's getting your attention about something and simply asks you today, to whose authority will you submit? Let me beg you today, make the right choice. It'll be best for you and it will glorify him. Let God Let God do what he wants to do in your heart today. Would you bow your head with me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Very special moment between you and the Lord. Maybe you're here today or you're listening by live stream, watching, and you've never trusted Christ personally as your Savior. You've never placed your faith in Christ as the ultimate solution for your sin. You are concerned that you do not have your eternal security settled. Maybe you don't know if you have ever asked Jesus to be your Savior, but you're concerned about that. I would encourage you, after this service is over, would you find myself, anyone, any, either of us pastors here or anyone else really in this church who could open the Word of God And show you today, before you leave here, how you can know that you are a child of God with Bible assurance. Hey, Christian, are you at a crossroads? Do you need to realign your submission to God's authority? You followed your own thinking and your own sufficiency for far too long now, and you recognize that you need God's help to submit 
once again to him. Why don't you reach out and ask him to help you with that? Why don't you in humility say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I make a mess of this with my own thinking and my own conclusions and my own actions. But Lord, would you help me to submit to your authority and what you want to do in my life? Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to submit wholeheartedly to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to give in to our own thinking, our own approach to life, but in humility, in obedience to your word, and in a desire to be like Christ, because Christ is our everything, may we respond with complete submission to you. It's not an easy thing, Lord, we admit, but nothing's too hard for you. And we ask for your help with it. In Jesus' name, amen.